Well, I'm not sure if everyone is back, but we should start <coughs> in the Dominic Pullo, and, and then we'll have the shorter paper by uh, Hamon Weiss in his absence. Okay. <coughs> Thanks, Joao. Um, so, is the invention of memories necessary to identities? Um, I would begin by a, a kind of a paradox of identity in Europe today, and we, we have talked a bit uh, about uh, that question um, before the coffee break. Um, the configurations of uh, identity through memory and heritage left the greatest mark on the last two decades. Memory, identity, and heritage have benefited from nearly unprecedented success echoed by the growing field of study, the memory of business, or the memory boom, that has consecrated their research. Probably, as uh, Aleda Asman stated, I quote, it's only since then, uh, so one generation, that the connection between time, identity, and memory in the three dimensions of the personal, the social, and the cultural has become more and more evident. The notion of identity as a semantic field that evokes, I quote the, the Oxford English Dictionary, the sameness of a person of things at all times or in all circumstances, the condition or fact that a person or thing is itself and not something else. The word address also, I quote, the continuity of the personality, the quality or condition of being the same in substance, composition, nature, properties, or in particular qualities under consideration. Following this uh, definition, one can think that uh, uh, the 18th century, and I, I have a slide about uh, the famous Abbé Grégoire, uh, the uh, French uh, uh, Christian and, uh, uh, in fact, uh, Republican, uh, who published, uh, and um, this is the English translation, uh, an essay sur la littérature des Noirs, uh, which is one of the uh, very important work about uh, the identité noire. And uh, the uh, question of identity in the 18th century was uh, uh, linked to literature, to the production of uh, literature. The, another famous example is uh, the literature, the books by Madame de Stal about uh, the German identity and German literature. So I will be back about uh, uh, Grégoire if I have some time. So one can think that uh, uh, national identity uh, first uh, singles out a nation from the rest of the humanity as being somehow different or typical, and second, articulates or suggests a moral, characterological, collective, psychological motivation for given social or national features. In this kind of discourses, the reference to temporality is always present. Identity is a testimony of continuity. Identity is supposed to be an evidence, an univocal definition related to an immutable reality, uh, something that can be violent, of course, especially in the 20th century. Even in, in fact, and we have um, said it uh, some um, minutes ago, individuals possess very different identities and multifarious memories. Hedren Fries comments saying that comparing the social sciences since the 1940s and the political issues today, the result is a paradox, paradox I pointed in this introduction. And I quote her book, uh, within social theory and philosophy, one can observe tendencies to question and ultimately dissolve the concept of identity, whereas social practices emerge and increase in significance that persistently thematize, create, and threaten identities. And in fact, as uh, Brubaker and Cooper said in 2000, social analysis has become massively and durably since 
sensitized to particularity in recent decades, and the literature on identity has contributed valuable, valuably to this enterprise. It's time now, they said, to go beyond identity, and that is more or less our conclusion uh, in, the, in the first part of this session. So, in the global history of uh, the interface between the written and the oral, as said uh, Jack Goody, memory and its most traditional instruments have always been struggling against oblivion or forgetting. But for the, from the Enlightenment onwards, the ability to remember came to be seen as a secondary faculty. After the end of the art of memory in the 19th century, several factors of transformation changed the intergenerational memory to a purely mediatized form of memory that no longer bears any direct relation to the past. Here you have the famous theater of memory by Giulio Camillo about which of Dame Frances Yates has written a, a famous book and which is the epitome of the art, the classical art of, of memory. The establishment of memory as a field of inquiry in the social science modern period is largely due to the work by the sociologist Maurice Alvax and more particularly to his work on the social framework of memory published in 1925. Maurice Alvax uh, referred to the shared memory of the diverse social groups or family as a means to maintaining their identity. And he point out, I quote Alvax, that one can speak of the existence of a collective memory and the social frameworks of memory, and it is because our individual thoughts are framed by and participate in this memory that we are capable of remembering. I um, put here uh, the comment by uh, Jan Asman about uh, Alvax's uh, theory and the uh, fact that uh, Asman uh, uh, rewrite, uh, so to speak, uh, the Alvax uh, enterprise about social uh, phenomenon of uh, memory. But more and more, the category of collective memory has been elaborated as a specific one and has become an object of research of its own related to cultural identity for anthropologists and, for example, for uh, geographers such as uh, David Levental and to cultural landscapes. But in the historical field, the collective work initiated by Pierre Nora about realms of memory or memory sites for uh, lieu de mémoire has been mostly influential. Uh, Nora describes lieu de mémoire uh, by this uh, motto, I would say, where memory crystallizes and secretes itself as a particular historical moment, a turning point where consciousness of a break with the past is bound up with the sense that the memory has been torn. And this was actually the, the departure of the uh, enterprise of the Lieu de Mémoire at the end of the 70s, when Nora uh, saw the French memory disappearing um, and the European memory being uh, appealed to uh, reign in the future. But nearly all the national histories of memories more or less linked to the French enterprise are more or less, and I quote Astrid Hell, restricted to the study of those ways of making sense of the past which are intentional and performed through narrative and which go hand in hand with the construction of identities. In some, they paint the same nexus, intentional remembering narrative identity. So what is the new agenda of cultural memory and cultural heritage? Taken in a classic sense, the heritage process tends to preserve the past through its material traces. Its intention is to valorize rather than criticize. For example, in the last 30 years, the famous author David Lavental 
has written a lot of books and has assimilated heritage with a representation of the past appropriated by a community to exclusively instrumental ends and dedicated to promoting an identity-driven past that is hardly occupied with authenticity and even less with truth, but devoted to glorifying a, a mythicism memory. Heritage, in some, incarnates a false conscious of the past, and its relationship to the real memory has become very suspicious. Today, uh, I would say that for a lot of historians, such as uh, Jay Winter or uh, Geoffrey Olick, um, the agenda of research is becoming more fluid. Uh, collective memory being uh, a highly complex process um, involving numerous different people, practices, materials, and terms is no more, as Oleg wrote, either, I quote, the authentic residue of the past or an entirely malleable construction in the present, but a fluid negotiation. In the field of memory studies, the notion of a, a cultural memory appears now central, coinciding logically with the cultural turn, or the so-called cultural turn. Aleda and Jan Asman have set recently a whole range of categories of memories according to the passing of time and the dialectics of public and private memories. The cultural memory, supported by some classic frames, so monuments, museums, archives, but also by the artifice of contemporary media, plays a role of unprecedented importance in the public sphere, fueled by claims that lead to new memorial obligation. Aleda Asman, particularly, makes use of a division imagined by the cultural historians Jacob Burkhardt in the material past between two categories, messages to posterity and simple traces. In the active memory, and you have a piece of uh, um, Jan Asman uh, thesis, in the active memory, he said, works of art are destined to be repeatedly reread, appreciated, staged, performed, and commented. And only a small percentage acquire this status through a complex procedure which we call canonization. End of quote. So we have at one end of the spectrum the museum. And at the other end of the spectrum, the storehouse is set for cultural relics, uh, a storehouse which is uh, uh, only for specialized historical curiosity. Throughout European history, material elements of the past, presented as repertories of monuments, collections, relics, have been identified with the prestige of a territory, of a ruler, of course, and the glory of the prince, the quality of a population, the spirit of a place, have always been partially defined by historical consideration and aesthetic judgment of value related to such material. This might be the classic definition of uh, uh, patrimony, and especially uh, of museum. The best example of this uh, is probably the collection of the Capitoline Museum in Rome. In the course of the 18th century, the develop and 19th centuries especially, the development of antiquarian science reinforced the relationship between patriotism and artistic or archaeological research. In the mid 20th century, the writing by Walter Benjamin on the concept of history in 1940 brought in a new mutation. It becomes necessary to write history, as he said, against the grain, that is to say, from the point of view of the defeated against the historicist tradition. And its formula may be applied more widely to a large part of the 20th century situation in terms of the relationship between heritage and uh, uh, critical writing. According, he says, to traditional practice, the spoils are carried along in the procession. They are called cultural treasures. 
They owe their existence not only to the efforts of the great minds and talents who have created them, but also to the anonymous toil of their contemporaries. There is no document of civilization which is not at the same time a document of barbarism, end of quote. And of course, the quotation by Nirere, by President Nirere, is a good um, example of this uh, leitmotiv. A lot of subsequent criticism of heritage processes build on this formulation as do indeed the possibilities of a counter heritage, of an heritage of darkness, of counter monuments too, uh, I, I suggest uh, the, the monuments by uh, Johann Geertz, or uh, this display by uh, a contemporary artist and Turner Prize winner, Jeremy Deller, in the Imperial War Museum in 2007, uh, where Deller uh, tried to display the sufferings in the middle of a triumphant museum of uh, uh, England uh, by exhibiting um, uh, a, a car, uh, a blown up car uh, uh, from Baghdad. This is a kind of a, a transition uh, to uh, open question uh, now. Uh, first of all, uh, can cultural heritage be mobile? Can cultural memory be uh, mobile? The question of uh, mobility of the heritage in European context stands in a difficult relation with national or local identities. The entry of object into museum raised more or less explicitly the question of a rupture or a specific phase in the life of objects. And for a long time, the memory and the identity of the museum were understood according to the glorifying logics of collection or on the contrary, as a narrative of reparation in relation to objects unduly seized and assembled. The contradictions between the meaning of an object in, in environment, in situ, and its place on the development of institutions such as the museum came into focus in the 19th century at the same time as the development of nation and nationalism. And discussions related to property and legitimacy were central in the formation of a new collective culture of heritage. The analysis of such debates needs to take into account the history of those philanthropists and patrons who, in a number of cases, hoped to gain in respectability by contributing to the growth of public collections. It also needs to include the history of those social reformers who pleaded in favor of the positive values of the museum as a place that allowed visitors to be inspired by elevated ideals. And these debates relate the museum to questions of political theory, to the notion of individualism and liberalism, philanthropy, and the role of public, and especially of institution. Today, um, I would say, uh, such initiatives such as uh, Lending for Europe project uh, aims to facilitate museum objects mobility. According to uh, the project, uh, you have the website here, one of the key questions they said is, should we stop hoarding and start concentrating on the better use of the already existing collections? Should museums have easier access to those parts of each other's collections that are being underused? Should museums start thinking differently and they conclude, digital platforms can easily help museums to create ways to look for and find objects that the collection is desperately lacking. It is simply a matter of wanting to open those doors. This mobile property testifies for some privileged networks of uh, circulation and cultural transfer in, in Europe highlighting the specific role of ambassador objects, such as uh, some uh, theorician of uh, science said. 
But more generally, the idea of a portability of things is an interesting one, which could be used as a means to develop a new sense of uh, heritage, identity, and memory in the modern culture. But it means also that we could resolve the, the issues of the recognition and acceptability of different memories and identities in uh, Europe. So it is a question of uh, dealing anew with national heritage. And I uh, choose to uh, display here some uh, examples from the French situation between the universalist identity proper to the republic and uh, local uh, memories or postmodern memories. In the social uh, construction of identities, heritage have always been caught in the tension between the display of a collective self-presentation and the embarrassment of a self-knowledge of failures, and especially of collective failures. Today, museum may represent shame as well as images of glory in a political means to enhancing the present greatness of the country. The last generation of a museum of identities uh, our Museum of Migration, and uh, uh, you have here the uh, Museum of uh, Colonial uh, Glory, uh, which was built in Paris for the Colonial International Exhibition in uh, 1931. And the building is uh, today a historical monument. It's protected as a testimony of the art and public art, especially. Uh, of the 30s, which it is, and uh, now and there was a lot of discussion about the, the destination uh, of this building, and now it is a, a museum of immigration. And, um, it was just uh, inaugurated by the new president, even if it is open uh, for uh, uh, some years, but it wasn't has never been inaugurated by a previous uh, president, so it's a, a testimony of the, uh, some difficulties about it. And this uh, uh, museum uh, of identity uh, differentiates from other ones uh, by calling on familial uh, memories and personal memories. Uh, he, he wants to incarnate a kind of utopia of a democratically shared past where all visitors can participate in a kind of historical research and uh, writing. Uh, on other cases, and some uh, extreme cases, uh, we have uh, what, what Paul Williams called Memorial uh, Museum. And uh, Williams, by the way, is uh, uh, an American uh, who is uh, walking in the uh, mall in, uh, in Washington for private uh, practice about the, the new um, museum of uh, black American people and before the Holocaust Museum and, and so on. Memorial Museum, according to uh, Williams, um, is characterized by uh, a display of sensitive artifacts and images by a geographical location, often critical, uh, by implication in political controversy, uh, implication for the visitors in particular in relation to some uh, uh, events and uh, of course um, by a special status of memory and testimony. Uh, in the words by Aleda Asman, um, the problem is that this kind of museum confronts, I quote, all visitors to a place that is at one and the same time a museum, a crime scene, and a memorial. And uh, I would try to um, uh, demonstrate the difficulties and the paradox and the ambiguities and so on of the relation between uh, identity and memory uh, by focusing on this part of uh, the French territory. This is uh, um, Atlantic coast uh, um, around the city of Nantes 
And the part uh, in, uh, in red is uh, territory uh, of the civil war uh, between during the revolutionary era between the, the blue army, the Republican army, and the white uh, counter uh, army, uh, so to speak. That is the story of the peasant resistance uh, to um, Paris, to, to, to the armies of the Parisian Republic. So uh, this uh, civil war was a, a disaster for the counter-revolution, of course, and uh, it, it was a dark uh, side of the Republican uh, memory. <coughs> but uh, for the bicentenary of the uh, French Revolution, so in 89, the political power of the department, uh, which was a extreme right or a right uh, conservative right uh, party, decided to build a very um, remarkable uh, building, in fact, two buildings, you have a aerial view, uh, a memorial, the, the, uh, uh, behind, and a, a museum in, in the forefront. Uh, uh, this memorial and this museum are part of a kind of memorial complex and the site is very particular because it's the site of a, a destruction by a Republican army of a, a church and of a little uh, a town. And it is uh, a kind of a destruction that uh, the political power of the department called a, a French oradour, that is to say a kind of a, a evocation of the Nazi uh, um, destruction of a French uh, village during uh, World War II. This is a monumental new um, display, uh, location of the uh, destruction church, and this is uh, the museum, the new uh, museum, uh, I think. Um, but you have in, inside the uh, I think it's not plugged. Uh, so <laughs> before it disappeared, sorry, but it's not it's not running. So inside the museum, you have this kind of uh, display, which is uh, obviously a, a testimony of the Catholic resistance to uh, the revolution. So. This is a, a very strong manifestation of uh, local memory, but of course of uh, political exploitation. But if you uh, come some kilometers, you enter the city of Nantes, and the city of Nantes uh, is on no. <laughs> and the city of uh, Nantes is uh, with a, a socialist uh, mayor. Well, it's strange because. Ah. <laughs> yes, but it, it doesn't work. So, <laughs> okay, I hope it will be. And uh, you have here a, a, another monument, which is a monument to uh, the history of slavery and uh, trade, and which is a, a, a huge monument to the rights of man. So uh, it's, uh, I would say, uh, a contrary monument, a monument about culpability of the ancestors and the sufferings of slaves, obviously not of uh, Mercants of Nantes. Uh, and it is part of uh, the so-called duty of memory, the new uh, duty of memory award, which entered directly into the political uh, field during the mid-1970s. Uh, and above all, uh, from the beginning of the 20th century. This uh, duty of uh, memory is linked to uh, new uh, laws, and we have uh, uh, 
talked about uh, a European law in before the, the, the break. Uh, there are, in fact, uh, four uh, statutes in the French uh, recent history dealing with the history of memory of the Holocaust, uh, the Negro trade and slavery, uh, the colonization, and the Armenian genocide. And uh, uh, these uh, laws, called uh, memorial laws, uh, polemical A, uh, have been at the center of a, a very hot uh, debates uh, about uh, memories, about values, and uh, how the discussion about duties and excess of memories are uh, linked to the pluralism and to the democratic discussions. In fact, in all countries that have known more or less uh, violent debates about the writing or the teaching of history, one of the main issues was to consider if the history could be changed according to the new demands by newcomers, or if it must be adapted in a better way to instruct the citizens and to build the community. And in the French case, some want to maintain the collective cultural memory that was built in the schools, but the time assimilated to the right historical narrative. A greater importance, said uh, some intellectuals, must be uh, given, for example, to some anticipations of the condemnation of slavery and trading in the French laws of the, um, of the end of the 18th century in 1994, uh, and of course is during the Second Republic uh, of uh, 1848. The aim is to make clear that the universalistic ambition of the French Republic was anticipating the idea of crime against humanities conceived during the Nuremberg trial, and that finally France has been really the fatherland of the human rights since the beginning of the Republic and even before uh, with the Enlightenment with Abbé Grégoire and, and so on. Another and last example is a question of dealing anew with the intangible heritage. And it's the question of a connection and acceptability of incorrect traditions in a new uh, identity. Everyone can uh, agree with Carlos uh, Closa, a Spanish uh, scientist, just that within the EU model of community of citizens and states, recognition of just claims on memory emerge as a moral duty. But uh, these claims are not just in themselves the need to be contrasted against minimal and shared moral understandings. And the obvious difficulty is that claims for recognition and memory in the EU open parts of national narratives and memories, and that simultaneously any demand for recognition needs to satisfy a test of its legitimate acceptability. One case is the Dutch celebration of Saint Nicolas, Sinterklaas and his helpers, Wartus Pieten. Uh, a lot of literature and polemics have grown uh, upon this case, and I quote in my paper uh, Mike Ball and James Clifford in a commentary of the uh, difficult moves between the necessity for memory and the future of identity in this case. Clifford uses for this demonstration a uh, um, reflection uh, which could be uh, resumed as, is this a tradition that can be reformed? Uh, we have a, an anti speed protesters, uh, but these protesters are in minority, I quote here, a recent article uh, by um, Sciences Po uh, Paris uh, Review. Uh, changes uh, are very uh, difficult, uh, even if the uh, United Nations launched an investigation into the tradition following concern raised by international human rights experts. Uh, the working group concluded that uh, they could not legitimately interfere, but they admitted to be deeply troubled by the virulent intolerance expressed by those who could not understand that there might be any problem with the uh, uh, feast uh, presented. Uh, so uh, the author uh, said uh, that one hypothesis 
is perhaps that uh, this colonial past is celebrated en masse, but I don't believe it, and probably it, it's not the case. Rather, it's uh, uh, what a journalist called unintentional racism, stemming from a lack of historical understanding, that is in your own an excuse. Or is the absence of a successful effort to facilitate honest dialogue about how history is Dutch uh, also not equally deplorable? So uh, sensitivity uh, to memory is obviously changing. And um, it's probably the case that the history of each uh, European nation must reflect uh, interest not only uh, as a he said, uh, she said slaveholders, but of course uh, on, on slave. Uh, for the moment, uh, interestingly, um, the judgment was that uh, the protesters were a minority and uh, the minority could not uh, put a term to this uh, feast because the feast is part of the unity and social unity. So it's a uh, <laughs> A uh, good example of the discussion we, we, we had uh, previously. My uh, conclusion will be uh, very uh, brief, and uh, I, uh, so <laughs> uh, I, I could have uh, returned to uh, Clifford, uh, who said that, um, in fact, uh, moralistic suppressions, hostile disarticulations will always be necessary parts of the process of reconfiguring uh, memory and, uh, uh, in this case, uh, commemoration. Uh, the necessity is to um, grapple with the negativity to the principle of collectivities to understand the dark legacies of the past. And, uh, of course, this dark uh, legacy is also part of a tradition, but it's also part of the historical practice and of the uh, critical uh, writing and uh, practicing uh, history that is uh, our legacy. So finally, the question are, can we have, can we invent a common identity and at what price for our previous memories? Or can we have and can we invent a common memory at what price for our previous identities? As we have seen before, European identity is a very controversial subject. But uh, uh, in the meantime, and more and more in the last generation, nearly everything seemed to be possibly dignified with heritageization, difficult word. And uh, I, I will quote, um, to conclude, the famous French uh, historian Lucien Febvre, who was indignant in 1953 when he learned that uh, Carlo Schinko was supposedly greeted to be one of the makers of Europe. And I have a slide with the uh, last book by Otto de Hasbourg uh, called, uh, in French, Charles Quint, uh, un roi pour l'Europe, a king for uh, Europe. Le Fèvre said, many thanks. Why not Napoleon or Hitler? So the invocation of truth by uh, this historian as a professional stance against the political and against the institutional users of the past is our legacy, as well as the anthropological criticism of a nation uh, presented often as a miracle or um, uh, as a mystery, uh, and that could be understood, on the contrary, as Marcel Détienne said, as a meat ideology. But the plea for particularities, for identities, and for the respect is another component of the cultural turn of the last decades, and the triumph of heritage is obviously part of it, when every claim about an identity seems about mobilizing a memory. Thanks. Thank you very much. So we'll go straight to uh, Hamon Lance's paper, which Jasper is going to sum up uh, from um, a summary that's been written of his paper by Roya. 
Okay, so this is, as Joe said, is an expanded sort of synopsis of the of the paper, which is much longer and available in Spanish. Um, on, well, I think in the pack. The paper describes the roots of what the contemporary understanding of culture and multiculturalism means for Europe. Based on a review and exploration of representative historical empirical examples, the author analyzes some political, societal, and cultural transformations that came with European romanticism and postmodern critiques and established a new democratic normative theory. This democratic approach encompasses conflictual and dynamic dimensions of culture as an essential aspect of identity, which can be analysed as a process of political building. The main contribution of the paper is to address the issue of multiculturalism as a semiotic cultural practice, in which identity, sociability and meaning are a constitutive part of culture, understood as a web of signification that gives life to any form of human, individual and collective life. This aspect is very much forgotten in the political science field in which culture is still analysed as political culture, that is, an understanding of culture as the aggregation of individual predispositions, or in a conception of multiculturalism as an approach that moves around the extremes between very holistic approaches or very individualistic ones. So what follows is a short summary of the main points of each of his sections in the text. In the political sciences, political culture has been developed in a very individualist form. Culture is mainly understood as an aggregation of individual inclinations. As a response to this, the collective dimension of political life has frequently been based on a holistic conception of culture, such as, for example, civilizations. As a consequence, ideas of culture in the political sciences have been based on, one, a conception of individual political practice that does not give any attention to aspects of intersubjective life and of the communication of cultural phenomena, or two, a closed holistic approach that is based on a very strong understanding of cultural social life in which there is no room for internal conflicts, changes and dynamics of transformation. The argument here is that the concepts of multiculturalism and cultural nationalism are intellectual products of two long-lasting historical events. One, the romantic critique of the Enlightenment understanding of civilization as a universal and progressive phenomena. And two, the postmodern critique of the modern ideas of avant-garde art and stylistic norms. This double debt is very important to help understand the practical and theoretical shift in multiculturalism and nationalism. Initially understood holistically, this shift to a more constructivist and pluralistic conception of both liberal nationalism and multiculturalism has brought us closer to an intercultural understanding of political life. Romanticism developed a modern critique of modernity itself by revealing its excesses without neglecting its positive aspects. The main critique was based on the idea of progress as a linear process and what it represents in terms of the human costs that were involved in it as a capitalistic exploitation and destruction of nature. The modern dichotomies of life based on the opposition between, for example, subject and object, reason and sensibility, were also part of what was contested between the romantic critiques and the modern thinkers. However, the romantic claims should be read not as a uniform corpus. They belong to a time of change in which reinserting human beings in nature or in its closed communitarian life was no longer possible. Here, a tragic consciousness is taken as a plural and conflictive process of collective and individual creation, the creation of societal structures that cannot be taken as a given. Instead, they are part of a constant process of creation, recreation and transformation of culture and identities that are not essential to any primordial form of collective or individual life. Based on Charles Taylor's approach, the author shows how this issue does not belong only to history. It is still part of contemporary debates about the normative foundations of political life. The second philosophical and artistic development responsible for the reformulation of the concept of culture in its nationalistic and multicultural variations comes from the postmodern movement. 
Postmodern approaches are responsible for the critical reformulation of at least five issues of how we think about modern culture. Subject, history, theory, politics and culture itself. These five pillars of modern thought have all been challenged by postmodern formulations. For instance, the full version of this paper discusses the limitations of a unitary conception of the author as a unitary subject, of history as a chronologically linear explanation of the supremacy of reason, of the idea that those who make theory can detach themselves from the world to make their encompassing grand narratives, the idea that politics can be seen as a project of universal emancipation, and the distinction between high and popular culture. Thanks to this critique, the concept of culture was irrevocably torn from the elitist understanding of what is good and what is beautiful being for the appreciation of a small elite only. Culture became understood as contingent and as an unessential group of elements, beliefs and semiotic practices, which develops in time and space because of its pluralistic composition, because of the existence of internal conflicts and because of the exchanges with different groups. Culture starts to be taken as a web of significations in which people live and make their ideas about the world. Their identities, their solidarity in politics are up for debate and extend beyond ethical, religion, linguistic or nationalist convictions. The contemporary understanding of culture in the political realm is based on both the sources just discussed but it is important to say that it does not accept any uncritical and radical relativization of the idea of good. It is so because they, one, keep the idea of shared, minimal, universal moral principles, and two, accept the existence of internal conflicts and expand the idea of pluralism inside established groups. The reformulation of the concept of culture makes it possible to avoid the holistic understanding of the natural tides created by communitarian life, as well as of the liberal individualism as completed and detached, free, constructed self. The concept of culture that underlies multiculturalism in its more intercultural version respects the relationship between the individual and the cultural environment, as well as recognising the link between community and culture. In sum, culture is seen as the meaningful world that belongs to a group, never what the group is. Every culture has its ambiguities and is open to pluralistic interpretations and contestation. This new formulation of culture has strong implications for the normative dimension of the political and of the policies that are made in its name. For example, top-down policies need to be replaced by bottom-up formulations. So, Participatory mechanisms, deliberative process and policy communities and horizontal governability will replace the hierarchical traditional way. The idea of accommodation highlights this process in which a new normative principle guides the formulation of cultural policies with minorities, not to the target groups. It demands that in principle every group should have the same opportunity to live the way of life prescribed by its own culture freely interpreted by them, and that they should never be submitted to any process that violates specific convictions that groups have. The accommodation principle does not begin with any essential idea of what exactly a specific culture is. Instead, it is more concerned with the normative guiding ideas that make possible the formulation of a cultural political life that is truly multicultural and democratic. This changes the priority given to a legalistic and juridical conception. Decisions that belong to the cultural realm by a more democratic and deliberative political process. In this case, a political body needs to accept that to accommodate is a process of making consensual changes for both minorities and majorities. In practical terms, the formation of this democratic process demands that three normative conditions should never be given up. Equal reciprocity, voluntary subscription, and the possibility to leave a group without exorbitant sanction, as well as a flexible right of belonging. This approach is not connected to any specific manifestation of modern nationalism, such as so-called civic and ethnic nationalism, something the author demonstrates by using a semiotic analysis to uncover the symbolic structure behind this political discourse. 
he develops what are the main dichotomies that sustain the binary division between ethnic and civic nationalism to show the limitations of this approach. Based on the discussion of four empirical cases, France, Germany, England and the US, and the work of Anthony Smith, this paper highlights the fact that there is always a strong relation between the ethno-cultural and the civic dimensions in every nation. The dualistic view does suit an empirical analysis of modern political development. Each version of nationalism that one finds in the world is a product of relational processes shaped by internal and external structures, by specific ways of creating political opportunities and singular forms of mobilisation and discourse. Taken altogether, it makes any attempt to produce a definitive synthesis impossible. One cannot freeze and then identify different moments as pure examples of either ethnic or civic phases. More important than the empirical limitations of a dichotomized analysis of nationalism are the theoretical shortcomings of this approach. There is no ideal type of civic or ethnic nation that can be formulated in theoretical terms. A conceptual continuum between the ethnic and civic dimensions best suits a conceptual framework for this cultural understanding of nationalism. In each moment, a myriad of different elements can be articulated and re-articulated according to the meaningful scheme analysed. To reach a normative theory of a democratic nationalism, similar conditions that the author used to analyse recent multicultural approaches should be incorporated. There is a new consensus emerging in normative political theory around the idea that democratic nationalism needs to base itself in the following five assumptions. One, every ethnic cultural nationalism must have democratic answers for key citizenship issues. Two, in most cases there is no correspondence between a cultural and a national frontier. No territory is a monoculture. Three, the nation is a politically open process that can never base itself on any taken-for-granted entity. Four, every political national scenario is the outcome of processes that can always be contested and need to be submitted to normative evaluation. And five, any deliberate process should be under democratic circumstances in which all constituent parts of a nation can take part equally in the process. The pluralistic concept, concept of a nation leaves behind the monistic assumption of a territory, a nation, a language, to open itself up to mandatory principles of negotiation, tolerance and equal respect among linguistic, cultural and religious majorities and minorities. It is possible if reasonable accommodation is normative and guides the whole process. To build up an illustrative and robust normative political theory of the cultural dimension, this paper highlights three aspects of the new concept of culture as it is treated in recent political science. In the first aspect, culture as an ensemble of meaningful symbolic practices, culture appears as a decisive aspect of political analysis. It is so because culture is what gives sense to political actions, organising its shared meaning and creating a normative horizon. This is worth stressing in order to make clear the assumption that everything that seems to be very stable in a given moment can subsequently be transformed due to change and struggles among divergent interpretations of cultural symbols. Culture is also a resource for mobilisation and political organisation. This second new understanding recognises the role played by social movements and of the strategic interactions among political actors. The last dimension regards culture as connection between individual and collective identities. Against the view that political life is made by the capability of actors to take rational choices, or the holistic view that predicts what each individual is able to create and do, this dimension shows that culture plays an important role in the definition of an individual identity without crystallising it in a given social form. It is so because each actor can interpret what a cultural symbol means and the cultural system is seen as a conflictive web of interlocutions. Culture can be empirically analysed as a contingent and strategic process of political building. The incorporation of this constructivist and relational agenda into the political debate about culture 
is a constitutive part of the normative theoretical debate about democracy, nationalism and multiculturalism in the contemporary world. Good, thank you very much. It's uh, quite a clear um, summary, I think, of the paper. Uh, so uh, what we're now supposed to do is identify what issues these papers uh, raise as regards new questions. <coughs> On, on the question of identity, I, I would like to, uh, to point that the difference between the identity as a, as a normative uh, uh, construct, which is uh, which, uh, which, which um, an individual or a group or a region or a nation identifies itself, it's a kind of adherence. It's a kind of creed or affiliation. That's one thing. And this is what is problematic, and this is what is refused uh, very often. But on the other hand, there is a, there is a positivistic fact, a manifestation of, uh, of, of, of the features of an individual, of a, of a, of a, of a nation, or of a, of a community, as perceived on the outside. And this is a fact. So that cannot be. Uh, neglected. So if, if we say that there is no such thing as European identity, but we should ask an American, or we should ask a, a, an African, whether what if, if, if I do something, or, although I'm not consciously uh, doing something in the spirit of Hungary, oh, it's not Hungary, that would be a different thing, a European identity, if, if he perceives, he or she perceives that that's typically European, then there is such a thing as European identity. Or if, if, I, if I do in a, in a um, how to say, in a normative way to something to express, and it doesn't go through, it, does, it isn't perceived as something which I intend, then there is no such thing as, as European identity. But this is the same as, as I, I just put it in Hungarian or uh, uh, whatever, whatever my government or, or myself want to do to, to build up a Hungarian uh, identity, if my Serb or my Slovak or my Austrian neighbor uh, doesn't, but has a different perception, it is that perception which is a fact which, which must be, must be uh, studied, accepted, and uh, acknowledged. That's, 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 that's separation I wanted to yeah, so the, the dimension of self-identification and the dimension of identity of something that what attributes to something. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. Which is, to some extent, good news when we talk about European identity. Yes. We may, may be uncertain about it, we are. Uh, but uh, the fact is that most non-Europeans consider European identity to exist. Right. That's, that's what I mean. Yes, yes. Exactly. exactly. Yes. Uh, the, yeah, the outside perspective uh, is definitely a relevant one. I'm just thinking back to historical testimonies of this is the famous, I forget, the Persian um, uh, entourage that was sent to Paris and France and wrote things that is very Persian letters. The Persian letters. Yeah, exactly. Montesquieu. Montesquieu. Persian letters. Uh, and then there's the Japanese delegation that's sent um, to figure out what European, what's specific about European creativity and industrialization. Um, and in many cases, of the recognition of the uniqueness of European thought, history, everything else from the civilization. The fact that the Ottomans copied the museographical practices of, uh, of Western Europe as an explicit way, both of modernizing but also dealing with their own complex imperial tasks. So I think that's a very interesting point to make it. Well, a central feature of identity is that it's a narrative that we, we tell uh, about ourselves, right? And and it is a construct. It is a construct. Which we, yes. when we shape ourselves, yeah. our personality, or yeah. when the Hungarian government now wants to create a new uh, yeah. idea yeah. of Hungarians. It works. If the Romanians will say, ah, yes, you are now different. But, um, but narratives constantly change with identity shifts. 
Yeah. Yeah, there's the Lou Baker Cooper article that, that you began by referring to. They won't share the concept of of um, of, of identity because it's too confused and too contested. But as is well known, at least in social science, uh, in a famous um, phrase, almost every concept is contested. And we get rid of identity, we can agree it's too confused, but we're going to end up with a functional equivalent of, of it and call it X, or uh, call it whatever you, 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 you want to. Um, but it's somehow going to c come back and we're, we're stuck with, with the concept or something roughly uh, like it, even, you know, call it consciousness or call it something else, self-awareness. Question is what of uh, what is it composed? And uh, I suggest that narrative is one aspect. It's about how other individuals or collectivities, be they small groups or whole nations, or even something as large as Europe, tell a story about themselves. And that story constantly changes. Yes, but the point is that. Uh, in any case, identity as a fact is also a social representation. So, for a sociologist, it is the explanandum and not the explanans. It, it's the, the thing to be explained and not, and not the explanation. Uh, instead, for, for instance, some of the extreme right in Europe, identity is the explanant. The, uh, the difference between uh, French or yeah, uh, exactly. uh, between French and uh, English, or the reason why uh, allegedly the Maghrebians don't fit into the French civilization is the difference of identities. It's a given. It's false. Yeah. It's a so identity for us is a, a thing to be explained. To be, of course technologies, its existence, its factuality, but not as a, a social factor. Well, the fact about identity too is that it doesn't explain, it, uh, the fact about identity is that it's not always clear that it is something constructed, like if we all saw ourselves all the time as totally constructed, we, we would fall apart. Uh, so we have to assume some Continuities and yes. narratives give that illusion of continuity, which uh, are probably needed. Yes, but and, uh, and of course, uh, certain cultural yeah. figurations that uh, uh, constitute uh, nations. Uh, but we can uh, dissolve the multiplicity and plasticity of mm. real culture in a single concept of identity. But well, what it's very striking for me is the um, phenomenon of uh, heritage and heritageization, I would say, uh, of uh, nearly everything which has uh, consequences for the, the making of identity as a social representation. I would quote uh, an event in the French case, the last president, Sarkozy, uh, wanted to create a museum of uh, national history in Paris. And finally, uh, this museum uh, uh, was a, a failure and he lost the, the power without opening it. What national identity? The museum of national uh, no, it was not called a museum of national identity, even if there, there were there was a creation of a ministry of national identity, you are right, uh, but the ministry disappeared in fact uh, after two years, if I remember well, and the museum came after that. And the model was the German uh, museum in, in Berlin of, of a precisely German history. Uh, but so there were a, a lot of uh, meetings and workshop, and uh, especially in the National Archives. And at some moment, one of the curators, because the, the, one of the problem, if you create a new museum, you, you need collection. So it's a new museum, you have nothing. At the beginning, you have nothing. So you must buy uh, something to put into the museum. And one curator in charge of the, uh, the prefiguration of the project 
said uh, bluntly, but is this this not uh, a problem? We we can put in fact uh, everything in in the in this museum, and it could be a museum of French history. So uh, it could be uh, not possible uh, thirty years ago, or even of course one century ago, because a museum must uh, be the, the display of some very precise things. Very, but the evolution of identity of, of memory since uh, the, the, the end of World War II and especially the 60s. Uh, the, the, the evolution is so that you can now say that. You put everything in the museum and uh, it's a museum of national something or memory, you call that memory, and uh, everything works. I mean, uh, if it is French or French product or uh, French uh, memory. So this uh, cultural turn has made a, a huge uh, possibilities, uh, very new ones, it seems to me, for making, uh, inventing memories, making representation, and doing that with uh, nearly everything. And this is very new for, for me, uh, comparing to the 19th or even the 20th century. So it's a, a kind of danger. It's for that I conclude my, my short version, saying that it's uh, a new difficulty now compared to uh, one generation, oh. perhaps. It's worst, I mean. <laughs> it's provocative, but I want to, to say that. Shall I have a brief remark talking about generations? of different situations within which uh, history and memory is taught and transmitted. Um, um, think of uh, uh, situations of uh, conflict or post-conflict, uh, for instance. <coughs> and what I could experience myself is that uh, nothing is more unbearable for a parent than the idea that uh, his own narrative within the family uh, uh, about uh, the curse of events, who did what, and who was right, and, wrong, and who came from where, etc., etc. His own narrative is at variance with what is being taught at school. And this happened regularly you know, uh, as, uh, in, in these situations where minorities uh, were obliged to move around and, uh, and to be schooled and so forth. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the, Clearly, the Serbs didn't have the same the same narrative as the Croats and, and the Bosniaks. <coughs> uh, this can be very destructive, uh, and uh, I wonder whether uh, I we were looking for solutions. Uh, if this was within the United Nations at the time, and we had executive power over schools education. So, so I could decide what to do, and uh, I I went for a blackout. I, I left the stop. Or stopping <coughs> teaching and the censorship of what was being taught. I, I, I was very uneasy about this. You know, because we really were crossing out uh, uh, chapters, you know, where, for instance, uh, mathematics, uh, arithmetic was, was being taught, you know, by uh, referring to the number of bodies uh, found floating on the river Drina, etc. Et you know, this was one of the classical. So I think that the uh, the, the academic world uh, should uh, should uh, make an effort to, to come to terms with situations in which uh, uh, it is better to put history and uh, events and the history chronology or interpreta historical interpretation, you know, a little bit in the freezer, and to replace it with by trying to give an awareness to young learners about the complexity. You know, of, uh, of, uh, of the phenomenon of uh, the past and the, the transmission of its of, uh, of, uh, uh, historical knowledge and interpretation of it, etc. You know, there, 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 there is some work done already in terms of methodology of history teaching and so forth, which we have uh, uh, using in several contexts. But I think we are a very long way you know, from being able to. Uh, to, to 
to provide the kind of uh, a sensitivity and knowledge uh, that will allow uh, uh, parents and, and, uh, and uh, uh, educational institutions not to be at odds in the way they, they produce messaging, messages, messages which uh, to the population are extremely important. If you ask at the time of, uh, of the Yugoslavian wars, you know, post conflict what was more important to them, health or education, they would say education, the education of their kids, of their children. And, uh, and when I went to look for, for some inspiration or from counsels, advice, you know, from uh, 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 very well reputed science, political science institutions and so forth, I didn't find much interest in dealing with real life and real events. They were too concentrated on their own little things. You see, whereas it was a great chance you know, to be able to learn and to get. And in a way, we are also in that situation. And uh, could that, that problem that you've uh, had with regards to Yugoslavia, which you know, in one sense could be regarded as an extreme situation, could, could that be more generalized? So I think it should be. I think it should be part of the citizenship education. I think yes. that is true. Teaching the citizenship education to some extent mm -hmm. should be. So we uh, should we, we should be thinking for some forms of integrating. Yeah. Uh, uh, to, to make citizens who can choose and decide for themselves. It, it, it is, uh, this is about, on one side, problematizing history, and uh, it's also about um, giving expression to different um, interpretations of history. Exactly. And sometimes freeing ourselves from history. And free yourself from history. From a Some, sometimes we yeah. need to forget. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then to remember. Mm -hmm. Then the burden of, of the past is too heavy for mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the conflictive. This is the Bruce Lee statue example from mm -hmm. Mostar. Yes. 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 <laughs> the Bruce Lee example. Yeah. <laughs> this, this would bring me back to uh, a couple of minutes of uh, transnational Islam, which I couldn't. Uh, say one, one thing which in your paper was mentioned about the World Heritage List and how the items are used for tourism and city branding and so on, which in an extreme form what, what the phenomenon I would like to point out is it could be called as, as memory cleansing because that in a mild form and sometimes that in a harm, how, well, how to say, in a what is it? Uh, an innocent, yes, an innocent way. Uh, it, it happens because these these communities, which have some kind of heritage, they are so proud of it, but they usually forget about the the past of these. And this is important in the eastern part, well, uh, in, in, uh, of of, uh, of the continent, where there was a lot of uh, population exchanges. The Jews were exterminated. The Greeks and the Turks were exchanged, and and whole, and that and uh, the actual population who is living there, the actual community who who may be very proud uh, and attached to that heritage, it totally appropriate. Sometimes in an innocent way, but sometimes really in a cleansing, a memory cleansing, uh, intentional way. And that is the 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 something which the neither Europa Nostra nor uh, the uh, World Heritage List, uh, not to speak of the European Heritage Label, they are not conscious about it. Just, just to point at a few cases like Saloniki, the Saloniki. It's only recently that they are thinking of their Jewish heritage, of their, but they don't care about the Turkish heritage, that uh, the uh, uh, what is it, the father of the of the Turkish Republic was born in Thessalonica, but they don't care about it, and and not to speak of the Slavs, or or also the uh, the Polish cities, which are very very careful about the, the heritage, but they never never even use the German name. That 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 uh, hundred years ago that heritage was was built was taught was by by people who speak German 
why not be a little bit more generous? Now, this is what I, I, I wanted to, to call, and there are uh, lots of, especially, in, in, because uh, even in, in Bosnia, those cases where uh, there are conflicts with people who remain, so they are there. But when they are not there, and their memory is being neglected, forgotten, and in worst cases, uh, uh, disappropriated, uh, hijacked, that is something <coughs> which is not nice in Europe. There, there, there is something uh, in Diatrina University, uh, the, the, a colleague who uh, work on the uh, Polish heritage with, in fact, the German, uh, and a kind of cooperation between German and Polish uh, about making something, this, this heritage. And this is uh, the foundation of the European University of Viadrina, uh, upon order, uh, which is uh, the good uh, yeah, means to do that. So, yeah, uh, some hope. <laughs> yes, on another note on the... Um, on the ideas of a narrative and eventually also the ownership of the narrative. Some people um, today, as regards heritage, but also culture in general, talk about the issue of the importance of the audience engagement, in, 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 in not only in how they access culture, but how they participate in culture and how they construct or build their own narrative or their own idea. There are a number of things that I think maybe one should look into in terms of this audience engagement um, aspect. And the other one is the very recent one. I think one of you named it in one of the slides, um, a participatory governance. Um, there are examples, and there have been uh, the best or bad practices in terms of um, how heritage is or museums or heritage sites are managed locally through a participatory process which goes public also in a way. And, and possibly those two um, lines should be eventually integrated in, in, in the research as well. Ultimately, both tend towards the idea of an ownership of whatever we're talking about whatever we're accessing, whatever we're uh, participating in. Yes, yeah, so, okay, that's good. That's related to your own issue about citizenship and cultural citizenship. <laughs> well, yeah. <but laughs> the, 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 the challenge then is also about ownership of intellectual property. And I, I find it very interesting that the agenda is being set in settler society. So, for example, we have the Maori um, saying, well, we're not going to have ownership of cultural property in New Zealand. We're going to have guardianship. We have exclusive rights over the way this is managed and catered for. Museums are now sacred spaces. They're not contact zones or spaces of just display. And so they become explicitly politicized through their own ethno politics. I could don't understand why Maori are needed to do that in New Zealand. But what's interesting is that has ramifications and impacts us where French law itself has changed to adapt to what the Maori now set up cultural property to enable restitution of Maori. Um, materials, uh, bodies in particular, but also objects from French museums. So the rest of the world has to adapt to those realities. And my fear is that whilst that works in the ethnic politics of settler societies, it can become totally explosive in other contexts, leading to greater ethnicization, greater identification. So the ownership, the idea of ownership of cultural property and self-determination is a very tricky thing to negotiate and, and to manage. I didn't talk about self-determination, but you're right. <laughs> but there's another another issue still which um, has been brought up, and it is how access and participation and, and, and becomes also a process of co-creation of cultural content, especially through digitalization of the whole process. Sometimes, uh, as regards also the newer generations, there is a different way of um, let's say, um, get accessing and participating in, which is not necessarily the ones we're used to. And one has to uh, take that into account as well. The narrative is no longer, what is said I think is that the narrative is no, lo no longer belongs only exclusively to the institution. 
narratives are generated elsewhere by other people. <coughs> are there any other comments we want to know for the last probably at the end of this session and um, in the case then well thank you very much for your contributions and um, we'll see you tomorrow, not later this evening. Thank you.